Hi, everyone, and happy Pride Month. We will get started with today's session. I am Jeremy, and I'm a representative of EHN Canada. If you're new to EHN Canada, we are a nationwide network of treatment centers for addiction, trauma, and mental health. We have facilities located in British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario, Quebec, and Nova Scotia. We offer high quality inpatient, outpatient, and online treatment programs. For more information, please visit our website at ehncanada.com. Just in terms of housekeeping, everyone is on mute and cameras are off for today's webinar, but please feel free to use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to submit any questions for our speaker today. We will try to get to as many questions as we can at the end of today's session and throughout. If you're wanting to turn off the chat preview, please click the up arrow located on the right of the chat box located at the bottom of your screen and uncheck the chat preview option. And please remember that this is a professional and inclusive space and offensive commentary will not be accepted nor tolerated. Today's webinar is being recorded and we will be sending out a follow-up email next week that will include the link to the video, any additional resources, as well as your CEU certificate. Again, we will be sending that out within seven to 10 business days post live session. I am located in Toronto. Toronto is located on the traditional territory of several nations, including the Mississauga of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. It is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississauga of the Credit. We also have presence in today's webinar located at our Edgewood facility in Nanaimo, British Columbia. They are on the traditional and unceded ter territory of the Coast Salish peoples, the traditional territory of the Sunnimuk First Nation, and Vancouver is on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. If you are new to this work and want to find out whose land you are on or grew up on, please check out www.native-land.ca. Many more of you may be physically present elsewhere, and I encourage everyone to use the chat function to where applicable, share whose land you are on. Now to get to today's session, Barriers to Mental Health and Addiction Treatment, we have the lovely Carly Campbell joining us. During law school, Carly was the recipient of a public interest law grant to provide a pro bono legal service in interior British Columbia, primarily in the areas of family and criminal law. She then went on to summer an article at one of the top litigation-focused law firms in Vancouver, resulting in experience with a wide, a wide variety of litigation matters. Carly was called to the British Columbia Bar in September 2013. Carly is currently working as the Director of National Operations for EHN Canada. In this role, she utilizes her background in both business and law to ensure provision of exceptional patient care. Carly also will aid in the compliance with statutory, regulatory, accreditation, and contractual obligations. Carly is actively involved in corporate strategy and business analysis for national operations. Thank you so much for joining us today, Carly. Good morning. Wonderful to be here. Yeah, of course. Um, so Carly and I were discussing things uh, beforehand, and we thought it'd be great to start off with a poll just kind of discussing um, barriers to treatment and what people have experienced in the past. So I'm just gonna launch that right now for everybody. And if you could just provide some answers then we can kind of speak to those different as well. So you'll see the question here, it says, which have you seen as the most common barrier to accessing treatment? We have financial slash cost, geographical location, stigma, concurrent treatment options, or a combination of these barriers, which seems like it's the, uh, the front runner with this. So we'll be able to speak to lots of different things today, which is great. So as those questions are coming in, I see a lot of people are utilizing the um, chat box as well, sharing where they're from. So thank you so much. And just to answer some questions in the chat, we will be sending out uh, the copy of the recording as well as some additional resources uh, sometime mid to late next week. So I'm just gonna end that poll and I'm gonna share the results here. So we will see again, the, the leader is a combination of these barriers being financial, geographical location, stigma and concurrent treatment options with a uh, second being financial and cost for this. So Carly and I will have a lot to talk about, I guess, today. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for sharing those types of things. So Carly, let's just get into it. Um, 
in your mind, like what defines a barrier to mental health and addiction treatment? And can you provide some examples? Well, and I mean, to, to be completely transparent, obviously a barrier is something for, like that inhibits access, right? So, I mean, I see a lot of comments in the chat as well around wait lists um, and having kind of timely access for people. Um, and I do agree that's a huge issue um, across the country, right? Systemic factors in terms of funding and uh, resources for beds. Um, there, other thing I will also say, though, that I often see um, outside of those systemic factors that is really cited by the person who may be reluctant to access treatment are, ironically, often the very, very, the very things that their substance use is created. So by that, I mean, like someone will say like, oh, I, 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 I'll come to treatment as soon as I get these financial issues out of the way. I'll come to treatment as soon as I resolve these court charges. Oh, I can't right now. I'm going through a divorce. You know, oh, work's too busy right now. Um, and work's really busy because obviously it can get quite challenging to handle things when you're engaging in, uh, you know, have struggles with mental health and substance use disorders. Um, and the other thing that I would also touch on is stigma. Right. And by stigma, I mean not only the external stigma, um, but also the internalized stigma that somebody having mental health or substance use disorders can experience. Right. Um, you know, in line with Pride Month, like that idea of internalized homophobia, that internalized like this is this is awful. Like I can't I can't be one of these people. Right. Like that horrifying idea that that would be something that's a part of someone's life can often be a big challenge for providers to overcome. And that cuts across any of the factors that might otherwise be present in this person's life. Absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much. And then, yeah, a lot of people are just talking about lack of support and education from family members. So I think that's an ongoing thing as well, which EHN is, and Edgewood specifically, has a great family program for these types of things, right? Like to be able to highlight those types of conversations where there is an education component on the family members or like the support network too, right? To be able to be more inclined and up to date with what might be experienced within treatment. Yeah, no, I agree with that completely. I mean, I think that, you know, and, and the one thing that I think was missing from my bio too, that might also be relevant here is I'm also an alumni of a treatment center, right? So um, speaking to the experience of, of, pre-recovery, right? Like oftentimes even not just the families or the providers don't know what's available, but certainly the person suffering from the disorder is also completely unaware of what's possible or available, right? And so that lack of knowledge can be a huge inhibiting factor that can get in the way. Yeah, for sure. Again, a lot more people are chiming in with wait lists being an ongoing thing. And then Child care and language barriers is another barrier as well. And then someone to take care of pets is an ongoing issue too. So I think, again, the, the multitude of barriers can really exist, like you mentioned. And we're just kind of highlighting a couple throughout today. Um, but I, we can get into these. So um, going off of those examples of barriers too, from personal experience working within this field, what have you seen as like the most common barrier to accessing treatment? I think honestly, the biggest barrier that I would see is, you know, I I personally think it is the stigma, right? I do believe that oftentimes a lot of the more practical barriers, the legal issues, the financial issues, you know, certainly the wait lists. I will, I agree with everyone who's throwing wait lists in the chat. The wait lists in the public system are incredibly challenging. I know at EHN, obviously, we're engaged in a lot of advocacy work and spend a lot of time trying to spend, you know, connect with um, all kinds of people in order to combat that issue. So by that, what I mean is I'm kind of going to jump ahead a little bit here is um, we have an entire team dedicated to sort of that education component and and there are business development team but what they're actually doing is going out to employers and educating employers as to why you know they should cover treatment for mental health and substance use disorders in the same way they would help support cancer treatment for an employee through their insurance program we are constantly connecting with insurers and and doing the exact same work right connecting with governments and explaining like this is a public health issue and emergency that somehow does not get treated like any other public health issue. 
right? And so um, really working in that space to do that advocacy work. I will also say there has been some incredible hope on the horizon. There have been some governments that have done, you know, historically um, been great at funding beds, um, but there's never enough. Right. And we do see some really revolutionary approaches, for example, in Alberta with uh, allocating a bunch of funding towards these recovery um, communities. And I'm really hopeful with that project and seeing what it might bring to the landscape, because I think um, what's being offered there are fully funded beds for up to a year. Right. So addressing sort of those ongoing barriers that um, can exist in that space. So meaning somebody does treatment actually develops work skills in the community, can go out and give a, get a job while still living and working in the community, fully supported year of treatment services and supported recovery accountability. And so that they can actually, you know, save up for a down payment on an apartment, save up to get a car to help support them, right? Like really addressing those larger systemic factors. Um, and obviously success in one province could, I would hope, be, be catching. But in the interim, we are also seeing a lot of other provinces as well show up with more funding. And, and at the same time, more still needs to be done with the, at the government level, for sure, right? Um, because Absolutely. it is such a huge crisis. Absolutely. Yeah, like you mentioned, Alberta, Saskatchewan being another government that's really stepping up to the plate mm -hmm. to provide like adequate funding and um like treatment for people. So like going off of Alberta too, as an example, do you want to speak to our uh, Red Deer recovery community? Just like how it kind of works and like a little bit of uh, the partnership that we have aligned with the government of Alberta? Yes. And so, and so that is a, a relatively new, it just opened in May. Um, the only requirement to get a bed at one of those centers is that you have an Alberta healthcare number and an address in that province. And of course that's because Health care is provincially, largely provincially funded and managed in each province separately. Um, and so that center is fully funded, all of the beds. Um, what it does is it's sort of, it's a therapeutic community as therapy sort of method, meaning everyone is participating actively in group therapies, but also contributing to the community and speaking to, I saw a comment there about employment, the longer you're unemployed, the harder it is to get work. Um, you then get your first job in the community itself, right? Um, you start to build those skills and if, or if somebody has a job outside, that's fine too, but you can start to rebuild those skills in the community itself. And then we establish partnerships with people as well in the community, employers in the community who are willing to then take on um, residents who are longer in, in recovery in the program and, and uh, who are going to show up and have accountability around their work and all that kind of stuff. And that we support them in engaging in those first steps towards um, jobs. So I think that can be a really huge, significant difference, which has not historically been a part of treatment, right? Like treatment has often been um, a shorter term focus um, that doesn't necessarily allow uh, a person to develop the recovery capital necessary to go out and be successful post recovery, right? Like you cannot put a person who was homeless back in the exact same situation that they were prior to treatment and expect them to somehow be successful just because they learned some skills during treatment. Like that is an unrealistic model. So I think this model helps to address it. Um, I will say some of our centers, though, extended care has always been an option in the in um, it's something I certainly participated in during my treatment. And that was key, right? Like this sort of stepped down living model of super intensive, more controlled environment then the next step kind of still being in an accountable therapeutic supportive environment but also being able to access the outside community learning how to engage in a recovery community how to go to a concert sober how to go to a restaurant and be sober right learning how to live differently and that's why to the comment down there having um we fundamentally believe in extended aftercare services right so all of our programs have a minimum of 10 months of aftercare included in them so that during that first year where the risk of relapse is the highest, the individual actual has ongoing support from the people they were connected to during treatment in order to um, learn how to live in a completely new way, which I can tell you is a very scary prospect, right? 
No, definitely. I, again, thank you so much for the breakdown of that. I think that's great. And then uh, there was a, a link shared as well, just highlighting the Red Deer Recovery community that Carly was speaking to. So if you feel free, we'll also include it as an additional resource too in our follow-up. So thank you again, Carly, for that. Um, so we do have a couple of questions that are coming in now to the chat box. So we can, there's a question here about uh, availability for services for seniors. So what is being done to help this population, if you can speak to anything with that? Well, and, and to my knowledge, to be fully frank and transparent, um, seniors are, are able to access programs like in the same way that any other age group would be able to access programs. I mean, throughout the network that we have, um, certainly everything from youth to to you know, there isn't an age restriction per se. I'm not sure if the question was, um, many here in Ontario are cut off at age 65. Oh, that's interesting. Um, in terms of the publicly funded system, it certainly wasn't something that I was aware of out in Ontario, that that was a restriction around accessing treatment beds. Um, in the, in many provinces, I, I mean, Honestly, I think the best thing that we could say, if that's the case, we could look into that and get back to you one on one about there being a cutoff around an age restriction. That's something I'm not familiar with. In most provinces, um, just like accessing healthcare at a hospital, age doesn't factor into the equation. If there's funding for a treatment bed, the age is is irrelevant in terms of accessing services for a disorder that somebody's suffering. So if you can give more context, perhaps in an email to Jeremy after the fact, we, I'd be happy to to chat about that. Um, otherwise, perfect. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we have one that is asking. So if one really looks at the language used in treatment programming, do you think that AA and NA contributes to the stigma based on language, such as moral failing and statements based on um, metrosophy? You know what? So at, at I think treatment centers, I'll, I'll speak to the treatment centers we have, right? So um, there is uh, evidence that supports the fact that participating in a recovery community, whatever that community is, right? Like people that have the same issue working towards a common goal, in this case, recovery and offering each other support increases the likelihood of a successful outcome and treatment. Um, at EHN, we offer a lot of other avenues for psychoeducational support, CBT, DBT frameworks, uh, smart recovery, Dharma recovery. We offer trauma-informed yoga for recovery. Like which recovery-based group and community someone most identifies with um, is, is up to them to pick something that resonates with them and to move forward. Um, certainly we are not aligned with any particular group. Um, we do see virtue in 12-step programming. We see it in the Dharma recovery programming. We see it in smart recovery programming. And what the goal is to offer somebody a range of options and tools and also the education and knowledge to say like, hey, a whole host and world out there and the online has opened up even more options for people to find groups that work for them um, and then engage in um, a supportive recovery services that um, resonate with them and engage with them. So um, certainly in terms of the AA or NA specific programming materials and the, and the language, that certainly isn't something that we as a network um, necessarily um, Push. I think that there over even the last decade, I would say the research in the space has come a long way, right? Like the treatment programs used to be very much 12 step based, you know, people in long term recovery or longer term recovery, helping people who were just brand new. There wasn't a lot of regulation in the industry. There wasn't a lot of education. And now there's been a marked shift to, you know, having licensed registered professionals, people not to understate the benefit of somebody in long-term recovery helping somebody who's newer, because that is always going to be part of the equation because of the hope, right? Like I know for me, one of the things that resonated most was the hearing my story come out of the mouth of somebody who had a life that I wanted. And so how did they get there, right? Mm -hmm. Like that cannot be undersold. Um, but certainly um, I wouldn't say that 
speaking to the barriers, right? Like if that's a barrier for someone, then we would just point them to something else, right? Like it's about offering a range um, so that a person can self-select into what's working for them. Absolutely. And then just speaking to inclusivity uh, within language, I have uh, shared a blog that I'll also include in our follow-up resources that we, it's an obviously an ongoing document that we uh, understand the importance of inclusive language and why it's essential to mental health and addiction care. So please feel free to give that a glance over, but yeah, I, again, I will share it as part of our uh, follow-up. And then again, just to reiterate for everybody that are asking questions in the chat, thank you so much for asking questions, but please ask them in the Q&A box so that they don't get lost within uh, the chat itself. Um, to move on to another question, we have, um, so how do we prevent the solutions to the problem from becoming the problem in the future? It's a very like meta type of question. So I think they're more so asking like the solutions that are potentially um, aiding the problem at hand right now, like if they become a problem again in the future, how are we gonna be addressing those? So again, I think kind of discussing that recovery is an ongoing process and that there could be different um, milestones in life or different um, roadblocks in life too. So maybe readjusting your um, recovery plan would be something that, and looking out for different programming would be another potential barrier as well. Uh, how do we prevent the solutions to the problem from becoming the problem in the future? I'm, I'll be honest, uh, if the person who wrote that wants to expound on, on what exactly that, which problem they see as being a potential problem in the future, I fear I might not be answering the question otherwise, because um, certainly the, the way I see it is the solution to the, the problem being treatment and sustained remission from mental health and substance use disorders, like to expound on what's been said in, in the chat as well. I mean, I'm trying to see them as they pop up while, while chatting. So bear with me if I missed it, but, um, the lifelong journey of recovery, right? So in, in my view, what works at the beginning tends to work over the course of somebody's life, right? Now, the meaning the core elements, right? So being a part of a recovery community, main, maintaining connection to other human beings who also understand the nature of, of, of a mental health and substance use disorder, right? Um, I think is so foundational to being inspired to continue the journey of doing the work that's necessary, certainly ongoing, counseling support, ongoing engagement, um, just basics, like having, you know, a safe place to live and some level of financial support, having, um, you know, nutritious food to eat and, you know, uh, able to go for walks in nature. Like I believe it's the four dimensions of health, mental, spiritual, emotional, and physical, and that ongoing attention to those dimensions of health that support recovery. Um, and so in terms of those solutions being the, a problem in the future, I don't necessarily see them as being a problem in the future. I actually think that like I often say in my own recovery, like I have a list of non-negotiables that I have to pay attention to each and every week. And they're just not optional, right? Like I go to meetings Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I go to the gym Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, I need like seven hours of sleep, oh my goodness, or I'm, an, or I'm a mess, right? Like I need to be connected to people in the program because I have uh, a, a disease that likes me to forget <laughs> that, that it wasn't, it didn't work out so well for me, right? Yeah. Um, especially as time goes on. So um, if there's a, if there's something that I think that I, I have a feeling that you might be pointing to something more systemic or perhaps that I'm missing there because I think those um, pieces do have evidence to support that they can be part of a long-term solution. Yeah, so then uh, they just actually uh, gave a little update too about intersectionality. So that would speak more to systemic issues as well. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think that there's, I heard this statement the other day, you kind of have to grow to even stand still this day, these days, right? Like it's, I, 
I think that those pieces as society continues to rapidly evolve and change, treatment programs need to be doing the same very much, right? Like there needs to be a much better lens on equity, diversity, and inclusion. And that means like paying attention to issues of gender, issues of culture, trauma-informed practice um, is certainly a requirement for training at our centers. And, and, you know, reconciliation work, right? And understanding that it's somebody who presents at a center um, based on whatever host of factors or intersectionality presents in their life, that needs to be addressed on an individualized basis as opposed to there was this historical traditional model that really focused on this sort of one size fits all, like go to this group, do this thing, too bad if that's not your gender, too bad if you don't believe in God, too bad if that doesn't culturally resonate with you, like this will work if you just do it. And that can't be the approach. Like people can't be made invisible. Their experiences can't be made invisible that brought them to treatment, right? Like they need to be addressed as a whole person. Absolutely. And like you've mentioned too, like it's such an individualistic journey, right? Like there's not a one size fits all approach, as you mentioned, and being cognizant of that, I think is the first step to potentially overcoming that barrier to be mindful that the patient or individual at hand might not be the exact same as the previous person that you've treated and being mindful that there are different intricacies with people and that not everything works for everyone and that they are you need to pivot and shift and attend sessions for educational purposes and to further yourself and to get those education um, points for yourself to ensure that you're engaging with different clientele and engaging and being able to serve those um, patients. I think well, it's super- I, yeah, completely. Sorry, Jeremy. I feel like oh, I jumped too quick there. Um, I and I think a big part of that is is a lot of that work too. It really. It's helpful to be when you're contemplating choosing a center, um, having an admissions department that is is fully versed in what is offered at the different centers. So we have everything from like, for example, at our network, a small 14 bed facility that is often very useful for somebody and it's a shorter term stay, right? So that type of center might be useful for somebody who, you know, perhaps has a job, has a family, can't take you know, two months or a year away from their life in order to engage in treatment, right? Is it really interested in like larger group work, wants to do more individualized things, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, up to larger centers that have like trauma specific programming. We have a center that is very much in the interior of BC that does a lot of land based um practices and learning and and a lot of outdoor exploration. Like, and so knowing the person and getting to know them even at the first point of contact and figuring out like what does work for them, what does resonate with them, what has worked for them in the past, right? As opposed to assuming that they don't have sort of any natural assets to bring to the table in terms of things that they know have worked, right? To improve their quality of life or have worked to bring them a sense of relief or comfort or joy, right? And then building on those by by appropriately placing somebody in a like the pairing, the pairing of program to person is so important, right? Absolutely. And like you mentioned too, like our admissions team is very well versed with this type of thing to ask those questions, to make sure that there's like a great pairing within, if it's not the specific treatment that you might've been reaching out about, we might have an alternative that might be better suited for you or a hybrid model of a program or something like that. Cause like you said, it's to ensure what has worked in the past, what hasn't worked, and then addressing those as uh, they come up kind of thing. Um, So a very interesting point too was brought up, uh, the possibility of being overwhelmed when realizing that recovery is a lifelong journey might be a barrier for people, right? Because that's so, that's a, lifelong is a long time, right? Like, (laughs) again, you can speak to this, like it's a lifelong commitment where, you're committing to yourself, you're committing to the others, you're committing to everything where that's a long time. And I can yeah. see the sense of overwhelming where it's like, oh my goodness, there's so many years ahead, which is great. But then it's also, it's it's daunting in a sense too, right? You know what? And it, it absolutely is daunting. And I remember that being something that I was wildly grappling with when I came to treatment, right? Like I wasn't in treatment because I could imagine life without alcohol, <laughs> or the other addictive processes I was engaging in. Like I, I was in treatment because I couldn't imagine life without it. If I didn't have this 
this problem, I wouldn't have landed there in the first place. So when it was, it was as though alcohol had been my solution for a very long time. It was my constant companion in many different avenues of life. And then, and then that solution broke. It wasn't working anymore. The relief wasn't being provided. And then I found myself in a quite fantastic conundrum. Um, and, and the idea of that being removed actually triggered quite a heap of, well, I should say it compounded the suicidal ideation that was already in existence at that time. And so what I always say to people is you don't have to do it for forever. Now I'm at a point in my recovery where I'm not afraid that I won't ever get to drink again. I'm afraid that I ever would. Um, but that took many, many years. But when I was very early on, I just, I say to people, I'm like, okay, so don't do it for forever. Can you do it for today? Can you do it for another hour? There were times when I was like, can you do it for five more minutes? Can you just stay in treatment for five more minutes? And, and literally it would have to become that small to seem manageable, right? Um, the the uh, best analogy I ever heard for treatment, uh, some, people, some people show up to treatment ready, engaged, all that stuff. And yet, and some people were more like me, like, I don't really want to be here. This doesn't seem like a great option, but I'm out of options. Right. Um, and so the best analogy I ever heard is like being in a, in a substance use disorder is like being in a pit of fire and using tiny Dixie cups to dump water on your feet. Right. You're not really fixing the problem. It's not even by the end, providing a lot of relief. Um, but treatment is like, you know, the counselor in treatment shoves down a metal ladder and is like, uh, you know, I have a way out. Um, but first you're going to have to stop dumping Dixie cups of water on your feet and climb this nice hot scalding metal ladder, right? Because like all of a sudden you land in treatment with all of the issues and problems and pains and traumas that compounded the problem in the first place. And now you don't have the wonderful numbing agent, right? That you've used to cope. And so it's, it can be a very challenging agonizing process. So don't, don't, don't do it for forever. Do it for five minutes. Right. And those five minutes will often build on each other. And what will invariably happen if the substance isn't picked up is it will get different. The feeling that feels so overwhelming or impossible over the situation that seems like it can't be overcome gets different. If you can just stay even for five minutes at a time and then those five minutes turn into days, right? Absolutely. And there's a comment here and then it said, that's why it's only one day at a time, one hour at a time, or only a few seconds. Mm -hmm. Cause like you mentioned too, like, can you stay sober for another five minutes? Can you giving you those tangible, like, goals to reach and then you're achieving as an ongoing basis because a lifetime again is a big big chunk of time right oh, yeah. so it's hard to quantify that where you're able to easily reach five minutes or you're able to reach those little tangible next steps and if they're more bite-sized I, I find that there'll be a better progression for those types of things for sure um okay so to get to more questions um what resources are available in treatment to help people experiencing barriers uh, in treatment? Well, and I think that, that that is really an important question. And it's something that um, is so fundamental. So going back to the comment we made at the beginning about how substance use disorder, often the people are pointing to the very things that their substance use or mental health issues have created as being the barrier to enter treatment, right? Whether it's work or financial stresses or workplace problems or legal issues. And, and what we have in place at many of our centers um, are either what's called transitions counselors or patient care specialists. And essentially what they do is offer case management services, right? So, so often people think, oh, I can't come to treatment. I have a legal issue going on right now. Well, actually, let us help you. Um, interestingly, probation officer and bail supervisors tend to be very supportive of changing the location on a bail condition to be a treatment center, right? Like there, and sometimes people just don't know that that sort of thing is possible, right? That conditions can be changed and they're actually quite willing to do that in many circumstances, obviously consult a lawyer. Um, but um, those conversations can be had. And while in treatment, um, you know, certainly COVID had many, many 
drawbacks. Um, one of them, however, was not increasing accessibility, right? So, I mean, I've had people attend treatment or sorry, attend court online via Zoom, WebEx, all kinds of platforms um, where permitted in their matters so that they can actually be in a safe place while they're going through something that challenging, right? Um, you know, it runs the, the gamut from trying to help find somebody start finding housing and transition supports at the beginning of treatment um, so that it's that's seen as part of the equation, right? Not something that needs to be left or that the person has to deal with after treatment. It's something that we try and actively work on over the course of treatment. So essentially think of these people as like system navigators, right? Because ironically, the systems set up to help the most disadvantaged and challenged in our society are often ludicrously impossible to find your way through, especially if you're struggling with any kind of um, mental health or, or SUDS issue. Um, so we have support specifically in place to help people get connected to the assistance that they need and fill out those incredibly long applications that require 10 million checkboxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and those are across the network, correct, Carly, like uh, at all of our different uh, facilities? Yeah, at the majority of the facilities, yes. Um, there are certain programs, and I would just like this, and, and that's just because oftentimes there are certain, um, like, so for example, our, our first responder programs, if they often have extensive case management services offered that got them into treatment, so those centers won't necessarily have those supports because they're already in place, but at our other major centers, absolutely. Perfect. Thank you so much. And then we have a question here about uh, insurance carriers. So mm -hmm. how do you find working with insurance carriers? I find many people have insurance, but barely any hold any insurance plans that cover inpatient treatment unless the provider holds a hospital license. It's very frustrating. Yes, I agree with you. I think the insurance industry, frankly, in Canada is quite a ways behind the, um, in a lot of ways, our healthcare system is far better, in my opinion, than the American system. But in this particular instance, like in the States, if you have insurance, it's pretty uncommon that it would not then cover uh, mental health and substance use disorder treatment. It's again, an area of where we're trying to promote systemic change and do work. Um, my experience with disability or with insurance providers is you're absolutely right as a line of first defense, they will not um, do it unless it's a licensed hospital, which of course, as you can imagine, is a very um, high bar to set. Our Bellwood facility is a licensed hospital um, in Ontario for any who are interested in that. Um, the other avenue I will say where insurance providers will often come up, show up to the table with funding for treatment is once a person is on long-term disability. And that is sad to me, for lack of a better way, um, because what that is is often when they have somebody who's on long-term disability um, and they see this issue arising and it's pre presenting as a barrier to them actually recovering from the thing that has them on long-term disability. Then transparently, I mean, insurance companies this is the equation they live in, which is the cost of putting someone in treatment then becomes cheaper than the cost of keeping them on long-term disability. And that is a deeply sad yet true fact. Um, and so it's certainly something that we advocate for change in um, and something that obviously in as not being insurance providers, we lack some agency over, but we're always trying to educate and explain, right? Like if you treated this off the hop, then the likelihood of somebody being on long-term disability might go down substantially, right? Like trying to shift the paradigm through which insurance companies view it. Absolutely, yeah. And our referent relations team works diligently with these types of folks to ensure, like Carly mentioned, that we're having these conversations and that like she mentioned too, with long-term disability, that if you're addressing it earlier on and those types of insurance or types of coverage is available to the employees, that there's going to be a greater outcome for these types of things and they're able to invest in their employees. I should also flag out of an abundance of fairness to all the insurance companies out there. Sometimes it is also the plan that the employer has picked, yes. right? Like the levels, different types of care are offered in a range of insurance. And if they're willing to pay for it, of course, then those services become more accessible. So again, back to the employer education. And I will also say some insurance companies 
do are being progressive in this space, right? So I don't want to paint everyone with the same brush. Yeah, correct. Again, it's it's not uh, like an overarching theme. It's just that it's circumstantial with some folks as well. Um, okay, so there's been a lot of discussion about virtual care. So I, I would like to kind of address uh, ways to overcome geographical location as a barrier to treatment. So we can speak to our virtual care. We can also speak to hybrid outpatient programming as well. So what in like your eyes do you think is a way or a couple of ways to overcome geographical location as a barrier? Well, and just really building on what Jeremy just said is certainly online programming. Now, Bearing in mind the intersectionality factors, of course, with sometimes online programming, if it intersects like geographical location and poverty, then we can end up in a bit of a challenge. That said, even in those cases, right, like even in remote communities, um, there are often hubs where people would be able to go into a, a local center and perhaps access resources through a center to allow them, yes, with a bit more challenge than being on your own tablet or whatever at home on your own Wi-Fi, but there are options available in that way. And our IOP program can really assist with that. Um, the simplest way I think to explain IOP is I believe it's uh, eight, nine, 10. So it's eight weeks of um, online treatment, nine hours of group therapy at a minimum a day, plus a lot of other assignments, homework, et cetera, that happens outside of that structure. And then again, speaking to the aftercare piece, there's 10 months of aftercare. So what that allows people who say are, it's a program that can be done while you're still working. It is a program that can be done while you have small children at home. It is a program that um, is flexible to the needs of a particular person, their life, um, and their particular circumstances. So that can be a huge uh, benefit as well, because I mean, if you've got internet and a, and a means of accessing it, then you have the ability to access treatment. And again, governments are showing up with some, some governments are showing up with funded spaces, even in the virtual space. For sure. And then there's also a note too, that you can now attend AA meetings online with many time slots available. But like you mentioned too, with intersectionality being a factor about access to these types of uh, forums, but that's just another addition for AA meetings as well. Yeah. And then we can also, we've we've talked about it a little bit through like partnerships with uh, government or like publicly funded, or we can also with uh, referring partners and stuff like that too. But are there any additional ways to uh, overcome financial barriers to treatment? With with that, I would also I would honestly go back to the piece about the lack of knowledge, right? Like sometimes people just are not aware about the the various options that might be there, right? And financial barriers are a very real thing. Um, but certainly calling an, an admissions department and, and they can walk you through like, okay, are you eligible for a publicly funded bed? You know, going through the various options of where those beds are available, what do you qualify in those types of ways? Um, if you have some funds, but not sufficient funds, okay, well, there are these types of loans available that are offered for medical treatment and they can point you in those directions. Oh, you're, there's, for example, sometimes people are part of a cultural group or certain, um, you know, um, bands or supports in the communities, we can refer them to, or colleges, work colleges. Oh, you're a lawyer. Why don't you approach this lawyer's assistance program? Perhaps they can help. Um, why don't you try and approach your band? Maybe they're able to assist with payment for treatment. Like sometimes people just aren't aware of just how many options there might be. Um, an employer sometimes is an option as well. That's a, certainly something that warrants consideration and our and our admissions department would be able to walk you through that, right? Like, again, speaking to the stigma piece, um, certainly this is not something that should be discriminated against, but I certainly would be lying if I said that every employer was wonderful and, and, and wasn't going to treat it in that way. Now, there are avenues available should that happen, but that's something that bears consideration. But sometimes people are aware like, oh, my employer sent my colleague to treatment, right? And they're just afraid to and need the support to kind of figure out how to have those conversations and admissions can walk people through all of those kinds of, of approaches and, and point them to resources that might be able to assist them with overcoming financial barriers for sure. 
And like you said too, at the beginning, like stigma kind of feeds into this, right? Like you said, with people reaching out to um, their employers or reaching out to respective insurance providers, whatever it may be, there, there's an ongoing stigma that is associated, unfortunately, with mental health and addiction treatment, right? So it's yes. that working up the nerve, not only to admit that there's a problem at hand, but to also like reach out for help. And there's been comments too, like people associate like reaching out for help as a, a form of weakness. Yeah. Where, like you're trying to hone in on your power and you're trying to empower yourself, but it's hard to see it in that moment, right? Like it's, yeah. it's hard to see that it's not a point of weakness. It's that you're, you're, you are trying to better yourself, but you're also asking for help, which is hard for a lot of people. Yeah. Yes. And I think that piece too, about like just the knowledge that this is not some sort of moral failing or a lack of willpower. If you were a better person, you'd be able to overcome it. Right. Like it, that is not the nature of uh, any mental health condition or substance use disorders. And they are all protected at law as well, right? Like not that I ever want anyone to get into those sorts of struggles, but but it's like, nobody goes to somebody and says, oh, I have cancer. And they're like, oh, sorry, I think we're gonna have to cut some of your work then, right? Like it's the same thing. It's a medical condition that uh, deserves to be treated as such and offered the exact same um, care and concern and support that any other me medical disability um, would be treated with. Yeah, it's, yeah, again, it's it's a very unfortunate circumstance with these types of things. And the more that we are able to speak about these and the more that we're able to have conversations, I'm hopeful for these types of things to be destigmatized. But also, like you mentioned too, being realistic is that there are avenues in which they can help. So like you said, speaking to admissions or like partners as well, that they can help you navigate those conversations or they can help you at least initiate those conversations. Or like you mentioned too, reaching out to admissions at any respective facility, not just at EHN Canada, they can walk you through that if there is coverage available to you or if there's government funding that's available to you too. Like there's those types of avenues, but also being cognizant and recognizing that that's a huge step in itself is just the initial reach out. Yeah. So that barrier is being addressed, which is great. And that's amazing. It's just that taking that next step too is, is a big thing. Yeah. Um, so going off of this too, what is a piece of advice you would give to someone that is experiencing ongoing barriers to accessing treatment? Oh, this is a, this I think is a really big one, right? So um, I think that, I think, you know, it's actually something that I heard from somebody else once upon a time, but it's like, you never know when it might be day one, right? Like, and I think sometimes I'm like, I would say there is hope, right? There is hope, even if you can't see it, somebody else is going to be able to see it, right? Like, please persist. Um, you know, if you if you call the admissions department and they weren't able to give you the help they need, please, please don't let that one be the only phone call you make. Mm -hmm. Right. Like call another one. Um, you know, I think that in the recovery community itself, there's avenues, you know, go to go to meetings, ask people what worked for them, ask them who who they connected with. Um, you know, I think that um, in terms of of the practical issues as well, like. And, and to be fully transparent and, and, and a little bit, perhaps this may seem, you may not always like your choices, but you often have them, right? And that's something that would really struck me when somebody said that to me in early recovery, like, um, yeah, like sitting on a wait list is not ideal. Absolutely not, right? And if I could change the systemic factors creating those wait lists in a heartbeat, I absolutely would. But you can, but to use that as like, well, then I'm not going to sit on any wait list at all. Right. Like, please don't do that. Right. Like, you know, um, call, call another center, think outside the box, right. You know, um, how can, how can, what supports can be offered while you're on those wait lists, right. In terms of, you know, because the reality is I, I agree, like being on a waiting list is a, is a, is could potentially a deadly factor. Right. And so what kind of supports in terms of harm reduction are available because dead people do not recover. Right. So like, how can we help create a container in which there are options available and supports while people are on those wait lists, right? 
Um, and I would also say, I'm not sure. And, it, and if it is somebody who is like, well, I can't go because I can't do it because of work. I can't do it because of my family. I can't do it because of whatever the case might be. I think it becomes more of a question of like, do you need to wait for those things to get worse? Um, do, is that what it would take, right? Like nobody ever, I don't think feels fully ready for treatment. Please do not wait until you're ready. Right. I think that's an elusive state that never really comes. I think our growth often comes um, and transformational change can happen from a place where you're scared and you do it anyhow. Right. You're not entirely sure this makes any sense. And, and then your life gets infinitely better. Um, but it's it is it is a big, scary thing. So um, I don't think there's ever kind of this true sense of. Ah, everything is perfectly arranged. I am ready to walk in the doors and I'm fully ready to change my life. Um, it's, it's, the ex lived experience of that is quite different. And so um, reaching out to people who've been through it and our admissions department has many of those humans, people at EHN like myself, right? Like we're always available to have these conversations as well because we know what it's like to walk through those doors. So being able to offer that advice as well as often or sorry, lived experience or hope is often incredibly useful too. Yeah. And like you said at the beginning of this session too, where you're able to see or hear someone that was in your position and then you're seeing them on like the other end of treatment, right? That you're able to have that sense of hope and you're able to have identifiable qualities within your own uh, addiction and see that there is a potential for you to grow through it and to still exist as a human just in recovery mode mm -hmm. so there, yeah it's just again it's such like a strong sense of hope that it's hard when you're in the addiction itself and you're pre-treatment to kind of fixate on that and to see that there's like that light but it's it, it, like you said speaking to people with lived experience is second to none with these types of things and yeah. people can speak to the intricacies of treatment they can speak to the intricacies of what worked for them what didn't work for them and how it's again it's so individualistic and i keep saying that but it is yeah. like everyone's recovery journey is so different because what might have worked for you might not necessarily work for the next person yeah but i think too that's that piece is if you're kind of showing up in spaces where there is recovery being offered whatever community that looks like right um and it, whether it's in meetings or whether it's calling admissions or you know resource centers community resource centers are often a very underutilized tool full of very compassionate people who try and just access resources for people and i think that if you're showing up eventually that sort of persistence will pay off because eventually you will find the person or people whose parts of your story like resonates and it's like oh I didn't think of that oh I didn't try that avenue right um but it can be definitely with the way um it can be challenging and feel hopeless at times but please don't quit and also like for people who are sober curious or people who have mm -hmm. tried sobriety and everything too like I think a big thing would be going to sober specific spaces. Like oh, sure. Pride as an example, like going to a sober space, you're still able to have the fun of pride. You're still able to experience all that, but you're able to pick the brain of people who are in long-term recovery or even short-term recovery. Like they, yeah. there's varying audiences, right? That you can navigate those and kind of dip your toes in, in a different way. Yeah. And still able to have those conversations with people. I think it's a great resource to kind of source out those sober events to like kind of see your curiosity through. Absolutely. I think that's a huge avenue too. And it also being at events like that also allowed me to see that like my life wasn't over, yeah. <laughs> right? Like seeing these people having fun, amazing lives that were full um, was really what was like, oh, I thought that would be awful, but maybe, maybe I got it all wrong. Right. Um, and that, that curiosity, right. Like change is not, this is not an A to B process, right. It is absolutely not. It's going to be twisty and turny and loop and kind of go all over the place. Right. So if you, if you show up one day at a sober curious event and you're at the bar that night, that's okay. Right. Like maybe, maybe tomorrow you, it looks different for you, right? Like you just, you never know. I think as you're moving on that change, I've often heard that people in recovery are seekers, 
Um, and I think that's very true, right? Like seeking, um, it, it is that journey of seeking and looking for what works for you because there will be a combination that does. No, absolutely. And like you said, like it's often referred to recovery as a roller coaster, right? And it's there's ups, there's downs, there's linear, there's all the types of things, loops, all that. But staying in the cart and just persevering through is what's going to get you through. And having that network, I think, is integral for that kind of stuff. And you're able to, at like these sober spaces, meet these types of folks that might become your recovery network or might become your sponsor or might become like those types of things where it could start off as like a harmless conversation just because you're curious. And then yeah. it could become a long term thing. Right. And we're hopeful for that. Yes. Um, so just to end, because unfortunately we have gone to our time, um, just to end with a final question, and we've kind of spoken to this, but just to maybe uh, further this, um, on the provider end, what is a piece of advice you would give to a provider that is constantly experiencing resistance from an individual or group of people that are in need of treatment? Um. I would say it really comes down to a triaging of legitimate life factors. So, I mean, in the chat, you guys have thrown up everything from pets to wait lists to financial barriers to success, systemic factors. And I think as a provider, kind of being in that space where you are helping them remove those objections one at a time, even though it can take a lot of work and a lot of creativity, until the person is literally confronted with the option that like, yes, their dog is taken care of, um, you know, even more working on a moms and kids program, like, like there's that those legitimate life factors that are objections get triaged to the point that the person is left with the decision to either go or not go. And it's tough to deny from that space often that like that, that that's the choice. Right. Um, and then I would also say again, like the same way that somebody facing barriers has to persist. Also, if you can find it in yourself to persist, because it can be very challenging to have somebody sitting across from you constantly pointing to the reasons they can't go while you're watching them die. Um, it can be a very emotionally challenging journey. And I think though, as long as they are still coming and sitting in that chair across from you or in the computer monitor across from you, there is hope. Um, because there's then some part of them that wants something different, even if they can't see it in the moment. Um, I sat across from one of my referrals. I mean, I did counseling for eight years before I landed in treatment. So, and then literally two years with somebody who was like, I think, I think maybe treatment like over and over again. And I did not go for almost two years. Um, and so like, please just know that like it is possible and you never know when that shift might happen. Um, and I also know now that I sit in the chair on the other side, just how challenging that can be to hold space for somebody. Um, so please also, we are here to support you all. And um, we do offer professional education and support and, and all that kind of stuff, or just as equally as someone struggling with addiction can reach out. So can a provider and say, look, I have this person. Is there any advice or solutions you can help offer me? Um, because I'm struggling. So absolutely. Um, Yes. And there's a statement in the chat box too that says thinking or considering treatment is the beginning of treatment. Yes, so absolutely. Think, like you touched upon that too, where it's like, it can be brought up so many times, but the when it comes into your mindset as a potential or even just the thought process in general, I think that's the start of your treatment journey. Yeah. Awesome. Absolutely. Well, to echo what everybody has said in the chat, very informative. And thank you so much for sharing your lived experience and also your professional side as well. And Carly, again, I can only say thank you so much and for your time and for your expertise on today's topic. It's been really great being able to share the space with you guys. I just wish we had longer to answer everyone's questions, but feel free to reach out after the fact. I know Jeremy will provide contact info. For sure. Yeah, I was just going to say we're going to send a follow up email, as I mentioned at the beginning, that will include a copy of today's recording of the webinar. And then there will be a call to action, too. If you have any questions that weren't necessarily addressed through this conversation, please email me directly. You can just reply to those follow up emails or you can email me at J Houston. So J H O U S T O N. I will put it in the chat at bellwood.ca. And then I can connect you with whomever may be the best fit to answer those questions at hand. And until then, we will see you soon and take care.